Switzerland, 1940. Amidst the chaos, the death, and the devastation of the early years of the Second World War, Switzerland sits as of yet untouched, protected by a long famous legacy of staunch neutrality. To the north, Belgium and the Netherlands have been swallowed by the Nazis. To the west, France has been partitioned between Germany and Italy. So far, Hitler and Mussolini have kept to their words. Switzerland has not been challenged. But the Axis powers are making clear all across Europe that nothing about the old international order is sacred in their new world. Now, Switzerland sits surrounded on all sides by fascist powers who have invaded and pillaged the continent with impunity. The writing's on the wall. Switzerland will be next. But the Swiss have no intent of rolling over for the Führer or Il Duce, or for anybody at all. In fact, the Swiss have been preparing for exactly this eventuality for decades, well aware that the day may come when their neutrality no longer holds any weight. Switzerland is primed for its own defense, ready to fight to the bitter end, and willing to use every tool at its disposal to make that happen. The whole nation understands that Switzerland might go down, but if they do, they're gonna drag the Nazis to hell with them. Switzerland is a nation with several claims to fame. Swiss cheese, Swiss watches, timepieces, Swiss banks, at least until recently, and Swiss skiing slopes. But nothing about Swiss history is quite so iconic as its famous neutrality, a 500-year legacy of non-intervention, non-expansion, and non-provocation that has kept the country completely out of foreign war since 1815 and kept it geopolitically safe for centuries prior to that. The Swiss policy of military neutrality is the oldest in the world, and by and large, the rest of continental Europe has agreed to have Switzerland's back in that regard. But to equate neutrality with pacifism in Switzerland's case would be a grave mistake. Prior to the adoption of a neutral policy, Swiss soldiers and mercenaries were highly valued in Europe, and even after their neutrality was guaranteed by a network of international treaties, the country maintained its ability to conduct partial or full military mobilization at any time. In fact, since 1874, Switzerland's constitution has specified that it considers its national military to include every able-bodied Swiss citizen in a time of war, and their military arsenals have been built to match. One Swiss story tells of a visit by Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II in 1912, when the Kaiser asked a Swiss infantryman what 100,000 Swiss soldiers would do if 200,000 Germans attempted to invade. The infantryman's response, according to the story, is that each Swiss uh, would have to fire his gun twice. That's been the crux of Switzerland's military policy for generations upon generations. We don't mess with you, and you really, really shouldn't mess with us. In today's world, this strategy is known as a porcupine doctrine, a policy that calls for a nation to arm itself to the teeth, build fortifications, maintain military readiness, and make itself seem like such a royal pain in the ass to attack that no reasonably sane country would ever choose to try. Taiwan in particular is using this strategy, as we speak, to defend against the prospect of an invasion by mainland China. And do let us know, by the way, if you'd like to know more about Taiwan's modern take on the Porcupine Doctrine, we can absolutely do a video on that. Use the comments. But look, Switzerland had its own reasons to adopt a porcupine approach, with geography being the major reason for its appeal. Switzerland is a landlocked nation stuck in Central Europe, sandwiched between France, Germany, and Italy, with Spain and the United Kingdom not very far away. If there's anything those nations all have in common, it's their tendency to host an upstart military leader every couple of centuries, with that leader invariably deciding that they'd like to take all of Europe for themselves. Since Switzerland isn't about to pick up arms and rush to oppose the leader of another European country, which of course wouldn't be very neutral of them, the nation is at acute risk of being surrounded or having a neighbor mass troops on the border unopposed before invading. Add to that Switzerland's relatively low population density and its relatively indefensible lowland regions, and the country ends up in a situation where it could very quickly be bulldozed by a powerful enemy if it didn't play its cards right. The answer was a strategy known as National Redoubt, sometimes referred to as a national fortress. In a general sense, a national redoubt refers to a situation where a given nation's military understands that it cannot protect its entire territory, either because of earlier defeats or because of a prior awareness that this prospect would be impossible. In a national redoubt, the military of that nation responds by pulling back to a certain area of the country that provides defensive advantages, maybe a peninsula, maybe an island chain, maybe an oasis, or maybe, in Switzerland's case, a mountain range. 
From there, that military force can hold out far longer, relying on the terrain's natural choke points and their own intimate knowledge of their home geography. And if they're really playing varsity, that nation might even have made sure that the location of their redoubt is fortified and supplied in advance, with not just enough room for military forces, but for the non-combatants, children, and other refugees whose homes must be given up in the spirit of national survival. For Switzerland, a nation with ample funding and a perfect Alps location to host an eventual redoubt, this strategy was perfect. They weren't the only country in Europe to pursue this strategy, though Belgium, Portugal, Austria, and the Netherlands all had a location picked out for their last stand, and even China had found this same solution to their ongoing war with Japan at around the same time. But Switzerland had taken the strategy to another level, and when we talk about a nation that was using this doctrine at a high level, well, that's going to be the Swiss. They had started laying the groundwork for a national redoubt in the 1880s, when large defensive fortresses were constructed at five key locations in the Central Alps. Erolo, San Maurice, and the Herbal Alp, Furka, and Grimsel Passes. At the time, these sorts of fortifications were considered the best of the best that a nation could have. After all, the Swiss of the late 19th century were just as clueless as anybody else when it came to the dangers of large-scale artillery bombardments, which wouldn't be revealed to the world until they were explained by force in the large-scale wars of the 20th century. It let us know what artillery does. But even in this regard, Switzerland was unwittingly ahead of its time. Unlike the fortified cities of Antwerp or Lisbon, these forts were high in the Alps, a naturally defensible terrain that the Swiss knew like the back of their hands. Once these major fortifications were built, the Swiss appeared relatively content with the national insurance policy that they provided. The nation took plenty of refugees during World War I and kept its army mobilized, but it never had to get involved in hostilities, so the fortifications were never needed. Even better, the interwar years saw Swiss neutrality recognized by the League of Nations, which saw the Swiss city of Geneva as its headquarters. But Switzerland also dealt with significant domestic turmoil in the 1920s and 1930s, from a prolonged political crisis to the dramatic economic impact of the Great Depression on Switzerland's export-heavy economy. The rise of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany greatly complicated matters as the rest of Europe, including neighboring France, pivoted onto a war footing, with Switzerland being forced to do the same. The French expansion of the Maginot Line had been an early cue for Switzerland to start working on its own defensive upgrades, taking advantage of high unemployment rates in the construction sector to hire a large number of laborers who could help out. But the real impetus to commit fully to the National Redoubt came from General Henri Goussaint, who was elected in August 1939 to the role of Commander-in-Chief of the Swiss Army. A highly educated career soldier, Goussaint had served during the Great War and thus spent years during and after the conflict intensely focused on the prospect of protecting Switzerland from foreign aggression. By the time he became the leader of the Swiss forces, he had developed a strong belief in the potential of the national redoubt and a keen awareness of the reality that Switzerland could either choose the strategy on their terms or have it chosen for them very quickly as soon as the lowlands started to be overrun. Now, during this time, Switzerland's civil and military leadership were focused on enduring a fascist Europe, whatever that would mean. In the name of survival, Switzerland played a relatively friendly neighbor toward Germany and Italy, recognizing their expansionist claims and making themselves invaluable as financial brokers, including as the keepers of Germany's war plunder and the capital stolen from Europe's Jewish population during the Holocaust. That decision, of course, was deeply repugnant. It still is. But it was also a reflection of the reality Switzerland faced, boxed in on all sides with no capability and, more importantly, no will to take the fight to the Nazis. Their goal was their own survival, and if it came down to a decision between survival and morality, the Swiss were going to choose the former. The Swiss military, now fully devoted to preparations for an eventual national redoubt, took the same philosophy. Survival. Even if it meant abandoning the lowlands, the major cities, and massive amounts of physical capital of their own. High in the Alps, thousands of Swiss workers toiled around the clock, tunneling into the mountains, creating bunkers and machine gun nests, and disguising their fortifications to blend into the landscape. And we're not just talking about a few little forts here, either. The defensive perimeter of the redoubt included 70 medium-sized citadels and over 10,000 small forts, bunkers, and command posts, all anchored by three fortresses, St. Maurice, Gothard, and Sargan. 
Every single defensive structure was built to be occupied for long periods of time by formidable numbers of men. Those three main fortresses, for example, were each meant to host over a thousand people. And these weren't the sort of tall, imposing structures one might find on the Maginot Line either. They were built into the mountains themselves, complete with barracks, armories, ample storage, and even underground cable cars, all arranged to fire down onto the steep slopes that an invasion force would be forced to climb, and whether the inevitable aerial bombardment that the Nazis or the Italians would attempt. But the bunkers were only half the story. The entire highland territory of Switzerland was built into a death trap, from minefields to anti-tank barriers to fortifications inside and around critical infrastructure. Every bridge and tunnel was rigged to blow. Every square inch of defensible territory was given artillery coverage, and hidden supply depots were so well stocked that the Swiss military considered itself ready for an indefinite resistance. The entire plan was orchestrated to be layered and redundant. Every outer line of defense had another defensive perimeter beyond it that the troops could retreat to, blowing up or otherwise obstructing access points after Swiss soldiers got out safely. Every gun emplacement was covered by other emplacements. Every fort had a network of support bunkers and established lines of retreat. Most importantly, the Swiss intimately understood the routes that an invading force would have to follow, not just to get through the lowlands, but to navigate each progressive step of the Alpine defense. And the Swiss ensured that every avenue of approach that they could reasonably attempt would become a mess of explosions and hellfire. Every inch of the Swiss defense would have to be climbed, often in terrain that motor vehicles had no hope of navigating and bullets would be flying at the invaders without reprieve every single step of the way. As far as the Swiss were concerned, this strategy would be the end of their war with the Axis one way or another. Their goal was to delay at each stage for as long as they could, with the inevitable reality being that they would eventually be driven upward where they would delay again before being driven upward again. Once they came to the Alps, there would be no possibility of escape elsewhere. The soldier could retreat from one fortress to another, but there was no getting off the Alps until either peace was established or the last Swiss defender was killed. Henri Gassin's final version of his National Redoubt Plan was adopted midway through 1940 and quickly disseminated to the military to ensure that all troops and leaders were on the same page. The plan was extensive, and it made no bones about the intensity of what Swiss troops would be asked and expected to do, up to and including the decision to barricade themselves inside their forts if there was no other option. Support for the plan was strong among the Swiss population, and it only got stronger in April 1941 when the Nazis demonstrated how swiftly they could overrun the hilly but not quite so mountainous highlands of the Balkan region. After this time, the full extent of the plan was revealed to the Swiss public, including that only the High Alps would be defended if the Nazis were to invade. And the pragmatic Swiss public understood, even despite the harsh reality that this meant that their homes and hamlets would be given away to the Nazis with only token resistance. The plan called for them to move into civilian bunkers a quarter mile underneath the surface, equipped for a long siege, and despite the unpleasantness of this concept, the Swiss people were ready. By this time in the war, the Swiss military had been mobilized in full, with up to 850,000 soldiers ready to fight. Of those, well over half were expected to be combat troops, protecting a Swiss population of just over 4 million. These numbers paled in comparison to the manpower that the Nazis could muster, but there's a big difference between 850,000 soldiers on the battlefield and 850,000 soldiers tucked away into countless underground bunkers, armed to the teeth and ready to flay a Nazi invader alive. At their disposal, the Swiss had over 500,000 Führer bolt action rifles, tens of thousands of machine guns, and more than enough anti-aircraft and auto cannons, plus a wide range of other military and civilian armaments. As was appropriate for both their geography and their strategy, the Swiss had only a small number of light tanks, but they more than made up for it in heavy artillery and anti-tank cannons. In the skies, the Swiss flew over 500 fighter planes, French model MS-450s, German Messerschmitt BF-109s, and Swiss D-27s, plus over 150 Swiss C-36 light bombers. That wasn't a particularly advanced or sophisticated fleet, but the planes could operate from small airfields built into the plan for the redoubt. Combined, the Swiss armament and equipment would have been only minimally useful in waging a war of aggression toward another nation. But in a war of pure, fortified defense, they'd do the trick. And so the Swiss dug in and made ready for the inevitable German invasion 
But of course, that invasion never came. Germany had laid the groundwork for a joint invasion with Italy, known as Operation Tannenbaum, and Switzerland had long been a target of disdain by Hitler himself, who apparently considered Switzerland's German population degenerate because of their adherence to democratic principles of governance. And Switzerland spent some four years as one of the only non-Axis territories in all of Europe, surrounded on all sides by thousands of kilometers of land controlled by either the Axis powers or their allies. Yet Hitler never pulled the trigger. And there are a few key reasons for this decision. Hitler had, of course, been surprised by the duration and fierceness of the United Kingdom's resistance to the North, and the battles there would end up demanding a far greater degree of continued military commitment than the Third Reich had anticipated. Not to mention, much of the time when Switzerland was surrounded would be defined in Germany by their failed advance into the Soviet Union, then the Red Tide that followed them back as they retreated home. But even that combination of factors doesn't quite add up on its own. As we mentioned, the Germans were able to overrun the Balkans, keep up aerial bombardments of England, and maintain a push into the Soviet Union, all with troops to spare. The later revised plan for invasion of Switzerland called for just 11 German divisions, assisted by 12 divisions from Italy, and the Germans were well aware by this time that the Swiss didn't intend to defend the lowlands. Most of their territory was a gimme for Hitler and Mussolini, and Germany seemed to believe that it could even draw the Swiss out of their posture in the Alps in order to be crushed in a direct confrontation. Now, though it's impossible to know for sure, it seems highly likely that the reason Germany ultimately didn't invade Switzerland was because the deterrent strategy of the National Redoubt worked. During the war, the Swiss kept busy with intense military exercises, drilling and practicing for the eventual Nazi invasion. They made little attempt to keep the general idea of their plan secret, and instead made public announcements to the Swiss population that were almost guaranteed to leak to Nazi intelligence about just the sorts of lengths Switzerland would go to in the name of survival. In fact, knowing that German and Italian spies were most likely present at the sites of bunker construction in the Alps, the Swiss would routinely exaggerate the fortress's alleged abilities and scale. Not for nothing, Switzerland's policy of appeasement towards Germany did its job by maintaining trade, buying looted gold, and lowering themselves to what we can only describe as complicity in the Holocaust. Switzerland made themselves look like halfway decent friends to the Nazis, while their military exercises and their fortifications reminded Hitler's deputies just how dangerous they could be as enemies. Again, we can't know precisely what was in Hitler's head during World War II, and dear God, we really don't want to, but at least from an outside perspective, Switzerland's plans for the redoubts and their adherence to a porcupine doctrine did exactly what they were meant to do. Beyond a few scattered air engagements in border areas, Switzerland survived World War II without engaging in a single significant military confrontation. And they did it all with their neutrality intact. In the following decades, Switzerland would not need to worry about a retreat to the Alps, at least not in the same way as had been necessary against Germany. Although the country is now surrounded by a different military alliance, NATO, it is utterly unbothered by the group, which we feel safe in saying has zero interest in a military invasion of Switzerland. Swiss defensive doctrine changed significantly during the Cold War, facing a Soviet threat that was concentrated to the east rather than encircling its territory. And as tensions have fallen and bunkers have become obsolete, the National Redoubt has faded into history. Most of the bunkers are now blocked off. Some have been sold, made into hotels, or converted to museums. A small number have been refitted to hold massive amounts of Swiss cheese and other Alpine dairy products. Yes. Really, and although the vast majority of the National Redoubt's fortifications never saw even a single bullet fired toward an invading Nazi, they await decommissioning after having undoubtedly fulfilled their purpose. To guarantee the survival of Switzerland against all odds and ensure a continued peace amidst a sea of enemies.